Senator Jason Barrett, who is, uh, I believe, uh, close to his uh, grand opening here for the, the new uh, restaurant here. Jason, good morning. Good morning, and uh, it's about 8.30, so I appreciate the opportunity. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we're out of time. So. <laughs> this, you know, this is the best interview with Jason we've ever had. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Everybody listening says the same thing. I get it. All right. and, you it's know, a tough room. Back to, you know, Bill Bill mentioned that I was bidding on the uh, yes. the the honor of having my here name put in John This was, at the, this was oh, at the hospice fundraiser. It was, and, and and I was only bidding to raise, you know, r- help raise money for hospice. I, I mean, you know, you have to have somebody that wants their name in a book like that has to be some, you know, politician with a huge ego, uh, which really applies to Mike Height. So I knew that no matter how much I bid, he was going to continue. And I don't have the money that he does. So I knew that he was going to come over the top anyway. So I was really just trying to help out hospice. You used to, but then you had to fork over the franchise fee for tutors, which is close to opening. Yeah, it's very close, actually. We should have the equipment um, arriving late this week, early next week. So once we set the equipment, we're um, really close. And so it, it's going to be very soon. Like uh, November? Yes. Grand early, opening middle event? Yes. yes. Some, sometime in November. Yes. Now, after you open, when you come in, will you be bringing biscuits? Well, since I've used the excuse for years that I couldn't bring you pizza because we weren't open yet, I guess I'm going to have to because I'm not going to be able to use that excuse anymore. Every time he called from now on to be a phone in, i got to call in, Rob. Yeah. i I got Sorry. problems with the ovens. Yeah. But, yeah, but keep inviting him. Maybe one of those times he will come in with biscuits. Yeah. Uh, also, can we talk about doggies? You can talk about anything you want. Yeah, I'll say. So uh, what is the dog business now? Uh, it's a dog daycare, uh, Happy Tales Dog Daycare, which is uh, located at 1103 Winchester Avenue, uh, close to the intersection there of 45 and 11. Um, so it's a, it's a daycare uh, that uh, people can drop. The, rather than leave their dogs um, at home in a cage or a kennel all day long, they can bring the dog um, to socialize with other dogs. And we take um, you know all the necessary precautions to make sure the dogs are separated that um, you know in order to be able to ha- to have your dog at doggy daycare there's a, a test and uh, uh, like a I don't want to say an attitude test but kind of um, <laughs> <laughs> the, the, uh, some of the owners get that too um, just to make sure that the dog plays well with others and it's, a, it's an environment that the dog will, will no I don't thrive. I don't want my little dog learning how to cuss and smoke cigarettes and stuff so that's not a no so that's no. okay if you if don't it, you don't have the tough dogs if the if the dog, dog doesn't learn that at home it won't learn <laughs> okay All right. I saw pictures I, I think Hardy did some of the work John Hardy did a lot of the work yeah he did a, a really nice job with it and, and the business also does a lot of grooming and the grooming is is taking off like gangbusters it's uh, uh, done a um, you know, we've had a lot of communities support, and, and Summer is really leading the charge on this. She is the brains behind this, as I'm sure you can imagine. So, well, I, uh, Hardy showed me the uh, the building after they finished doing the renovations, and it's amazing. It's it doesn't look like anything a dog would be, and that looks like it's fit for some of the finest people to stay. In. Yeah, and and he his crew did an excellent job, um, and they followed the direction that Summer gave them, which is why it looks so good. And that's so. how you wound up here as well, <laughs> following the direction Summer gave you. Yes, exactly. Remember when you used to be an independent man who. <laughs> Stood, stopped, stood, so stood long tall ago. on his it own. Was, you know, actually, our wedding anniversary was three years yesterday. So, oh, congratulations. So, so, no, I don't remember any of that. <laughs> <laughs> remember when you knew what to wear every day and yeah. you were confident it was the right choice? Yep. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> you could eat or drink and you survived all those years. And uh, yeah. all of a sudden, now you don't know what you're doing. How, yeah. How did that happen? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's beautiful. Hey, uh, let's get into it here a little bit. Um, Let's talk uh, first and foremost about the interims that are coming up next week in Charleston. Uh, I know these uh, can be uh, bland at times, uh, unless there's some serious work that needs to be done on issues that you're going to tackle in January, and those on the docket for you. Yes, and and I was just looking at my interim schedule uh, just the other day because uh, there's the magistrates want to meet with with me and and my counterpart uh, who is David Kelly who's the, the chair of jails and pensions on the or jails and prisons I'm sorry on the on the house side and so we were trying to figure out a time to, to squeeze a, a meeting and we were able to do it with magistrates but my my schedule is is really booked and that's one of the the differences on the interim schedule from the house side and the senate side when I was in the house um, you know may have one or two meetings a day but now I may have um, one or two hours of the day where I don't have a meeting um, in the Senate. So the, the workload is, is much larger. And, and the jails and prisons uh, is going to meet, uh, that committee is going to meet on Monday afternoon uh, where we'll hear from uh, Department of Corrections, um, where they're really just going to kind of give us an update on the legislation that we passed uh, in special session. Um, they'll they'll provide us um, 
information of, of about the implementation of, of the pay raises, how well they are working, um, update uh, recruitment and retention, uh, how that's going with, with the other things that we've implemented. Um, and so I think that's you know, that's one of the things that, that I'm uh, really looking forward to um, uh, this interim session. Uh, they're also going to talk about the maintenance. Um, former Secretary Jeff Sandy and I kind of Went around and around in Senate Finance one day when, uh, during their presentation because there was only I think twenty some million dollars that the, in the governor's budget for maintenance uh, deferred maintenance for corrections and I was trying to push the secretary to to really tell me what the need was um, and he said the, the need was around two hundred million dollars and I was pushing him to find out if that's actually what he requested and and the governor. Um, wasn't able to provide that or didn't provide that or if he didn't request it all and and you know I think he was trying to be a loyal soldier and and, and really not say and, and he said look that's what's been going on for a number of years and you know we were able I think largely because of that that conversation to to be able to put more money uh, in the back of the budget for deferred maintenance um, in our prisons um, so Finance is going to meet, as always, we'll, we'll go through um, revenue numbers, f see where we're at from a fiscal standpoint, uh, this part in the, our, as where we're at here in the, in the fiscal year, uh, several other meetings, but you know, sometimes they can be bland, but, but they're important. Um, and they don't, the interims, you know, they're, they're not something that's always going to draw a lot of headlines, but uh, it's really things that were issues that we're discussing that either agents are bringing, uh, agencies are bringing to us or um, some association or organization um, that, that represents some type of industry or some kind of a group across the state and, and they're just bringing ideas and, and problems to us uh, in these interim meetings and we can figure out um, you know ways to solve them and, and, and be able to get legislation drafted before we get there in January. Is that lawsuit against DOC still active? It's my understanding. Yeah. Bill? Yeah, Jason, uh, we pick on you some, but we also recognize what you've done for the Eastern Panhandle. You've been one of the leaders in the court system, both the magistrates and circuit, uh, circuit uh, judges. Uh, this comes, it's going to be very valuable, it's very needed in the county, uh, Eastern Panhandle, but it comes at a price, and one of the prices is the offices and accommodations for these judges, not only the existing ones, but the new judges. Uh, the Crawford Building is going to be the, the building that will be renovated to house uh, the overflow of the judges. Uh, that's, going to, that's going to be quite pricey, around $20 million, of which I think the city or the county is going to ask quite a bit of help from the state. Uh, do you see the state being able to help with the renovation of the Crawford Building? I think so, and that's, I believe, one of the things that, that John Hardy the last time uh, he was on the show talked about, you know, having mm -hmm. a supplemental appropriation yeah. to be able to uh, to help that out. And, and when you see the tremendous growth that we've had in this area, um, you know, that growth also becomes in the court system, unfortunately. Yeah. And and uh, one of the things that, that I see is, is a bit of a problem is that the, the Supreme Court pays rent uh, to the county for uh, some of the uh, the facilities there for um, you know courtrooms and that type of thing um, and you know I think the county has done a pretty good job really of, of playing a little bit of hardball with the court uh, as it relates to what that rate is and, and I've made the case to the Supreme Court that look you can't pay you can't expect to pay the same rent in a courthouse in Berkeley County that you do in Boone County um, it's just the, the, the rental rates are are not the same. Um, the, the the cost to to have construction and renovation work is not the same. So, um, you know, I think that there's a negotiation to be able to do that. I, I I always try to come back to doing things in a formula, um, just because I think that's fair across the board. And, and I don't, you know, I, I don't mean to pick on Boone County or Southern West Virginia. I want to be fair to them too. Um, but I just think that you know when you you come up with a, uh, some type of formula based structure as to how you set. Uh, market rates or, or what or let the market determine what the rate is for those uh, those courtrooms uh, just so that the counties are treated uh, fairly uh, and that the county taxpayer doesn't have to help foot the bill yeah uh, and I applaud that uh, but there's going to be a uh, an expense up front and that's going to be the renovation and that's going and to I be think that's where right, this yeah. the supplemental okay, uh, yeah, should be able to help yeah, and I think yeah. you know delegate Hardy has indicated mm -hmm. that, that he's absolutely going to take the lead in the house side on doing mm -hmm. that and I'm, yeah. I'm happy to yeah. uh, do what I can on the Senate side for that. Okay. 
<laughs> Mr. Gilstrap. $200 million is a lot of deferred maintenance. That's <clears throat> You can almost build a new jail for $200 million. What kind of deferred maintenance? That's not leaking toilets. That's uh, I th A lot of it is HVAC. Uh, a lot of it, uh, I think, are, are roofs, um, which are extremely expensive, and, and I can no firsthand, especially uh, HVAC uh, at the moment, but um, that's extremely expensive. And, you know, there are several uh, regional jails, um, obviously the prison at Mount Olive, uh, and it's things that have just gone on for years that, you know, the state hasn't been in a position to be able to, to, to fund some of these things. Now we are, um, and I, we have an obligation as a state to, to take care of our facilities. And I think that we're, we're getting on a path, um, you know, to be able to do that. And, and certainly when you look at uh, our prison system and our jail system and and those the deferred maintenance in those buildings then you look at deferred maintenance in higher education I think we all would say it's more important to do deferred maintenance in higher education we uh, we did a, a lot of deferred maintenance or funded a, a, a lot of deferred maintenance projects uh, in higher education this year too so I don't want that to go un, unrecognized but but we do have an obligation to do that in our jails and prisons too and, and, and we're making I think we made a big step in this past session to, to help address that is there hope do you think of in the near future of digging out of the staffing hole for corrections I, I think so and that's that's really the point of this jails and prisons meeting on Monday is to, to, to figure out our is the legislation that we passed in in a special session helping dig that hole or dig us out of that hole I should say uh, I think it will I think that um, anytime that 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 you provide significant pay raises that that's a certainly certainly they're in effect in the, at this point the yeah, pay raises yes, are yes. we seeing an increase in in recruitment well i think so and that's again that's what this meeting is okay. about for them to, to to give us a report based on what what does that recruitment retention look like now um you know what are what are our staffing numbers now how much are we utilizing the national guard still so i think that's all those things are going to be discussed on monday Pretty interesting business school study to come out of this. Is it really, is the staffing issue truly a wage thing? If so, that's that's an important data point as opposed to working conditions and, you know, it's working, in a, working in a prison, I think would be, I couldn't do it. It would be a very difficult sort of Yeah, it, it certainly takes a special type of person to be able to do that. And, and it's something that is not a, a problem uh, exclusive to West Virginia. There are a lot of states dealing with uh, struggling correct, to get correction workers. and uh, But I think that the, some of the, 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 the amount of money that the state invested in um, uh, training and going to the academy, uh, for someone that, that really hadn't stepped foot too much into a prison to really even work a shift to really see what it's about. And I think that that was really something that Senator Blair led the charge on was, hey, look, let, let's have them work inside the prison for a little bit first. Um, do a, a kind of localized training rather than send them to academy on day one where we spend, you know, thousand, I think $16,000 per employee. And that person gets hired, and three months later, they said, "This isn't for me. I'm out of here." And the state just wasted sixteen thousand dollars. That's Jason, a common sense solution, right there. Yeah. Sure. Own staffing, uh, DHHR. We have a problem with DHHR as well. Uh, is that the money, the, the a way to uh, solve it, or is the gene pool large enough of getting sufficient social workers to come in and work in DHHR? Well, I, again, I think it's. I think you go back to to the correction workers and say it takes a special kind of person to do yeah. that. And 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 historically, those in the social work uh, uh, field doesn't pay very well. Um, it's it's an incredibly uh, stressful job uh, from an emotional uh, standpoint, from a mental standpoint. Um, you know, I think there are folks out there, I think that, you know, obviously with inflation and what we've seen in the past couple of years, it's been harder and harder to try to get employees. I think in the private sector, at least, at least for me, it's been easier to get employees here recently. And I think that will, will also, um, you also see that in the public sector as well. So I, I I'm optimistic um, that we'll be able to, you know, to, to, to do a better job of filling these positions. Um, but, you know, when you have good employees or you expect good employees, you have to pay them. Yeah, speaking of, of paying them, so generally speaking, what is the going rate in Berkeley County as you're looking to hire people, Jason? What are people willing to work for, so to speak? Well, I want to be cautious about how I answer that. Uh, I mean, it just depends on the job, I think. I think that, you know, you, you can hire uh, someone entry level right now in the $12, $14 an hour range for, um, you, you know, I think that there's certainly uh, that's, uh, an, an, I, this is how I view it. I, I see, I struggle to see, to do any job in the area where someone is going to take less than 12 or $13 an hour. That's just, that. that's in my opinion. And could you imagine that? 
when the minimum wage bill was when was that passed and increased uh, eight years ago? It's 2014. So nine years ago, mm-hmm. it went to in a two step phase. It went to what eight seventy five an hour. Right, and, and then we had several people making seven dollars and twenty five cents an hour. Not me. No, I'm talking about in the state. I didn't have anybody mm-hmm. making that, but. There were a lot of pe- people employed at minimum wage when that happened, and it was increased to eight seventy five. I don't know any business that is paying someone eight dollars and seventy five cents an hour right now. I think the market, you mm-hmm. know, I think there are times when the market um, doesn't uh, bring wages up to where they should be. But I think now, I think we are. I don't, I don't see any reason to increase the minimum wage at this point because. Um, no one's paying it. Right, no one's paying it. and nobody will work for that. <laughs> no, that's exactly right. You mentioned uh, $14 as an entry level. That's less than $30,000 a year. Can people live on $30,000 a year and raise a family? I don't know the answer to that. Yeah. I, I think it would be certainly difficult. Um, but you also have to, you know, you ask a small business to have, you know, several employees where you're paying that, and then you have to keep prices uh, at, a, at a point where, uh, the average family can afford, so it's a balancing act of, you know, you, you know, I, I try to pay employees as much as I can, as much as I can, um, but also at the same time, I have to keep prices at a place where the average family can afford. Well, and the way the system's supposed to work, if if I'm working for you at at fourteen dollars, whatever it is, and it's not enough for me, I presume if I work hard and I get training, either you can promote me or sure. I say thank you and I take the training and experience I've got and I go and I sell it to somebody else for a higher rate. I mean, that's how we all build our careers. Yeah, it, and, and I wasn't suggesting that I, I wasn't outlining anything that I'm paying anybody. I'm just I'm just saying that I think yeah. from. My knowledge of being in the business community, I think that that's what you see as entry level positions. As people stay with the company and grow, they get promoted, they take on more responsibility, they they build experience. Clearly, they're going to get more money, or they at that business, or they do what John says, they use that experience to go um, get a better job yeah. or a higher paying job. And and, and I understand that. I understand uh, that's one of the inducements. But I come back to corrections, and I come back mm. to social work. I come back to the teachers. Uh, these are, in many cases, uh, f- well-trained individuals. Uh, what is the minimum that we have to pay? And I realize each one's probably different, but do you have a sense of what we'd have to pay to be competitive with social workers? Any sense at all? And it's probably an unfair question because I I, don't I, I, I wouldn't say that it's an unfair question. Okay. I will say that it's a difficult question for me to put a number on okay. because I just don't know. Um, I, I don't know. I, I can't tell you exactly what they're getting paid now. I can't tell you mm-hmm. what a social worker in Maryland or Virginia is getting paid. You would expect it to be less or here than it is there, mm-hmm. just as our teachers are. Um, but again, it's you know, the state has an obligation to to pay a competitive wage, and we want good people in those positions, and and we have to pay them accordingly. I can't put a dollar amount on each one of those yeah. jobs. I think that's where we kind of rely on the agency heads to come to us and say, hey, look, we, we need this pay raise. You know, we're struggling to get uh, employees in this particular field. Um, and it's because, you know, this is what they make in the private sector. This is what they make in a, in a border state, uh, in the public sector. Uh, and this is what we're paying. And that's that uh, huge difference uh, is, you know, if there's that huge difference, that's when that agency would come to us and say, you know, we need to see an increase there to be able to uh, attract and retain. The healthy employees. thing about it is we're having this discussion. Sure. And we, I don't. And we did not have the discussion uh, a couple, three years or so ago, either corrections or DHHR. Well, and we're able to have these discussions because of what you've of the the financial position that the state is in, um, largely because of policies that the legislature has implemented. Uh, we've, you know, increased or improved our business climate to be able to recruit large business here to 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 employ folks. Um, th- there's been a lot of things that the legislature has done. We've held the flatline budget. You know, we've controlled spending, uh, even when we've had these you know enormous surpluses. You know, I think that you, when you see spending that we do, the spending that we're doing, uh, a lot of this is one-time money. Uh, it's investment that we see a huge return on our investment, bringing these large companies here that. You know that, that they may get, uh, and everybody focuses on the, the help that they get, whether that's through a pilot, whether that's through some type of loan, whether that's forgivable or not. You have to think about the ancillary businesses that follow them who don't get any of those benefits, who also employ uh, so many people. Um, and, and, and it's very short-sighted to say government shouldn't be involved in that. And, and I wish government didn't have to be involved in that kind of stuff either. Uh, but when you're trying to compete 
with Jobs Ohio and you're trying to compete with all these other states that offer all these incentives, you can you can sit back and say, we're not doing any of that because we think it's wrong. And no one will come to West Virginia. Or you can say, hey, look, this is the game that we have to play. We're going to strategically uh, make these investments where we're going to have the best return on it. We're mindful that this is taxpayer money, uh, and we're doing this uh, to help benefit the state and benefit the taxpayer. Senator Jason Barrett, our guest here on the program in the first uh, segment. Jason, uh, I want to go to the departments that are uh, understaffed around the state. So estimates for Department of Corrections is, what, about 50 percent understaffed? So, But the legislature has to fund full salaries as if they had 100 percent staffing. At the end of the budget year, what happens to that 50 percent surplus salary money that these departments have or whatever the percentage of vacancy rates would be for each individual department? Does that money stay with them or do they ultimately give it back to the general fund? It, well, it's reappropriated. Uh, they, all, the, the agencies have reappropriated language in the budget where any money that they have left over is reappropriated to them the following year uh, that they get to keep. Now, we're aware of that and we're, we're mindful of that. And, and we have, um, you know, the ability to, to not fund them at the same amount. You know, so let's say an agency, um, you know, received $10 million in state funding. They spent $7 million. They have $3 million in, in uh, reappropriated dollars. There's nothing that says we have to come back and give them an additional $10 million. Um, so, uh, but all that all that reappropriated language is in there for agencies to be able to do that. But you're right, we do fund 100% um, FTEs, um, so which are full-time employees. Um, you know, a lot of times they'll they'll have to bring in um, someone from the private sector on a contract basis to be able to fill the job. Sometimes they'll pay people overtime, uh, but sometimes there is certainly money left over and that gets reappropriated. And it's something that we're mindful of and that we take into consideration when we're approving the, the next year's in budget. In the case of the prisons where the guard is filling in, is that uh, paid for by the feds or does the state still have to pay the guardsmen? The National Guard? Yes. Uh, I think there are federal, there has been federal dollars used for that. I don't know if we're still seeing um, f federal dollars used for that, but but the state is obviously paying part of that as well. Quick yeah. question, then we have to. Okay. End yeah, our picking up on the uh, example of the reappropriated dollars. If an agency spends uh, uh, has ten million dollars, they spend uh, seven million, leaving three million. Is that line item controlled, or can the agency use that three million dollars? <laughs> for deferred maintenance or something else? Uh, I, I believe, and I almost speak broadly, but I don't know that this applies in every situation, that there are there is discretion for them to be able to move money from one line item to another. Now, I can tell you with DHHR prior to this year, um, it, the, the, they have, the secretary had just been able to move money all over the place, and we pulled some of that back um, which was uh, Finance Subcommittee A, which I was the chair of, uh, and we we redid the budget for the facilities because that was the first uh, of the new agencies that was going to be implemented up and running. But we plan to do that for the other two as well uh, so that we can see line by line where money is supposed to be sent, where we appropriate money to, then we can come back and look at where the money was spent to make sure that it's been used uh, for the line item that we've indicated. But there is flexibility uh, through secretaries and department or agency heads to be able to move money around. We see that. Um, you know, and it's something that that I think that it's incredibly important that the legislature um, have that transparency and, and to be able to make sure that that these agencies are efficient when they spend taxpayer money. Senator Jason Barrett, thank you very much. Thanks, guys. Appreciate it. November Tudor's coming. Yeah, man. Right and around Thanksgiving. And next time he comes in, biscuits. It's going to be hot biscuits <laughs> and gravy. <laughs>